My name is Sister Mary Rose. I'm here to discuss chapter 11 with you of Frank Sheed's book, Theology for Beginners. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon us. Give us open hearts. We ask through the intercession and the prayers of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph that we would come under the shadow of your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, be able to understand and appreciate at a much deeper level what you have done for us in sending your only begotten Son to us. Amen. We pray one Hail Mary for all the sick and dying. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our holy guardian angels, help us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Frank Sheed brings out the point that the, although the Jews were expecting the Messiah for centuries, even as far back as the time of Moses, when God said to the, in Deuteronomy, Moses said to the people, the Lord will raise up to you a prophet like me, to him you shall hearken in all that he shall say to you. So for more than 1400 years, they'd been waiting for God to send the Messiah. And they knew from Daniel that it would be around the time when Jesus came. They knew from the prophecy of Daniel that he had received from the Archangel Gabriel, which is in the book of Daniel. For centuries, they'd been expecting the Messiah, but what shocked them was they, they didn't expect that the Messiah would be God himself. So we, in John's gospel, we read the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So word with capital W, we know, refers to the second person of the blessed Trinity. As John begins his gospel saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was made nothing that has been made. So the eternal son of the father, God from God, who has no beginning, at a certain point in time became man. And with, that's how we measure our time, that the year, whatever the year we're currently in, we're in 2023 right now, that that is how many years since the incarnation, how many years since God took on a human nature. So he took on a second nature. He's always been God. He has no beginning as God because God has always existed as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're co-eternal. But we always have to remember that Jesus has two natures. He's one person with two natures. He hasn't always had a human nature, but he's always had a divine nature. So by uniting those two natures in his one person, it was like the marriage of divinity and humanity, bringing, breaking, um, bridging the gap, bridging the gap that had been opened by original sin, which was more than a gap, was like a chasm, like an uncrossable chasm. But Jesus Christ brought us back into union with God. So it, nature answers the question, what? Like what something is or what it can do? Like what? We have human nature, so we can do what goes with being human. We can't fly because we don't have wings. If we were birds, we had bird nature, then we could fly. I mean, unless we were like ostriches or some other non-flying bird. But person answers the question, who? So the one who said, I in Jesus Christ, is God. He's God. He's a, he's a divine person. And that's real important to get clear in your mind that Jesus is not a human person. He's a divine person. He, he does have a perfect human nature, but he's not a human person. He's a divine person with a human nature. So he's one divine person with two natures. Now, this very important point to bring out that um, Frank Sheed makes a mistake in in saying that Joseph and Mary were engaged at the time of the Annunciation, but it's a very common mistake, very common. 
but it's important to correct it because our whole understanding of the virginal marriage of Mary and Joseph is rooted in the Annunciation. So betrothal was legal marriage for the Hebrews at that time. So the betrothal would occur and they would they would exchange vows at that time, but they would not begin to live together for several months. At that during that time, the, the bridegroom would be preparing a place for his bride. And then after that amount of time, however much time they had determined was was completed, then then the bride would move in with the bridegroom. And that would be the second phase of the marriage. But Mary was betrothed to Joseph. And we can even read this. You can, if you look at scripture, it's clear that they were married. They weren't just engaged because otherwise, why in Matthew chapter one does Joseph consider divorcing Mary? I mean, it's a poor translation, but but it like it does say that. So I mean, if they were not married, then they wouldn't, he wouldn't have considered putting her away privately, which is um, the counterternative translation, because they weren't, if they weren't married, I mean, so the, I'm emphasizing this point because at the Annunciation, when Gabriel tells our Blessed Mother that she will conceive in her womb and bring forth a son, and that he will be the son of the Most High, she says, how shall this happen since I do not know man? Now, in biblical language, no meant to have sexual intercourse with. So she she's legally married to Joseph at that time. So the question does not make sense from that point of view, unless both Mary and Joseph had had committed to living a virginal marriage, that they had committed to living as brother and sister, which normally is not God's will for a marriage. But in their case, it was it was the will that their first their first union for both of them was with God, like Mary is spouse of the Holy Spirit. And so, well, I, I don't wanna go off into too far of a tangent with that, but, but just to make sure that you have that clear in your mind that um, they were legally married at the time of the Annunciation. So God was beginning the restoration of the whole creation, which had, fallen into ruin with the first human couple with Adam and Eve. So now he's taking another human couple, Mary and Joseph, overshadowing their virginal marriage with his own Holy Spirit to begin the new creation, the restoration of what Adam and Eve had, had really destroyed by their sin. So the infancy narratives in the four gospels are in these four chapters, Matthew chapter one and two and Luke one and two, they're historical accounts. And that's important to also emphasize because it's another point that's under attack in some places where people will say that they were just fables or, but no, they are historical accounts. But Frank Sheed points out, we should read the gospels as if we had never read them before, because sometimes we just get into a, uh, you know, kind of like a dulled mindset. We're just reading. We're not even focusing on what we're reading, but the gospel is the living word of God in all scripture is, but in particular, the four gospels, which are the principal witnesses for the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. But he's, he says, notice the double stream of Jesus expressing his two natures. First, first his divine nature and the nature of man and how the apostles must have wondered. They, they were the question in their minds seemed to be, is he God or is he man? But like as Frank Sheen pointed out, like it didn't even occur to them the possibility that he could be both, which is what Jesus is, we know. So there's several passages in scripture where Jesus clearly asserts his divinity. Probably the most clear affirmation of it is in John chapter eight, verse 58, where he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. So think about what he's saying there. Like, and they, they, their response is, you know, you're not even 50. And have you seen Abraham? Well, I mean, that's what they say right before he makes this statement. You're not even 50. And have you seen Abraham? Abraham lived around 1900 BC. So Abraham lived almost as long before Jesus 
as Jesus lived on earth before us. But what Jesus said, amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. And remember, I am, whenever Jesus says, I am, it's a reference back to the burning bush when God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And, and Moses said, what is your name? God said, I am who am. So St. John really makes that a major theme of his gospel. Um, the I am statements of Jesus, like I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. Jesus gradually revealed his divinity. So um, he didn't, like, he, they wouldn't have been able to handle it, like, you know, it would be too shocking a realization for him to just say, oh, yes, by the way, I'm God, you know, I am your creator. I have no beginning. <laughs> so he knew their limits. And, and so it, he gradually led them to, the, to that realization, which we see with St. Thomas occurred on Divine Mercy Sunday. I mean, the Sunday after Easter, which we now refer to as Divine Mercy Sunday. When, you know, Jesus takes up the word that Thomas had spoken the week before saying, I'll believe if I put my finger into his hands and my, into the wounds in his hands and my hand into the wound at his side. And then, Jesus quotes that back to him. I mean, knowing, illustrating that God knows all our thoughts and all our words. And then when he actually does that, he touches the heart of God. He says, my Lord and my God. Every action of Jesus was done by God because he is God. So the one person who says, I in Jesus Christ is God and man. All of his actions, including those he does today, like coming to us in Holy Communion when we receive them at Mass, have infinite value because the man who is doing them is God. And one of the saints, I, I believe it might have been St. Thomas Aquinas, said that every time a person receives Holy Communion worthily, every single person in the world benefits from that, every single person. But but it makes sense because because God is infinite, so everything he does has infinite value. Jesus has no beginning as God. He's always been God with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He became man at the moment when Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. So in Latin, that first word is, is fiat, like be it done to me. And um, when, when God, if you read the very beginning of the Bible, when God first is creating the whole universe, he says, let there be light. So, so like the fiat of the father, let there be light. And, and then the, the, next, the next most critical fiat is Mary saying, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Because then by, by when she said that, yes, and she had free will, so she did not have to say yes, but thanks be to God, she did. Um, at that moment, the word became flesh. So the new creation, God began the restoration of the whole, of the whole rupture that had been caused by original sin, by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. So that's an important connection also because um, for the Jews, the, the glory cloud, which um, was, would lead them through the desert. When they were in the desert, there was a a pillar of fire that appeared in the night and by day it would be a pillar of cloud. And it, that cloud would overshadow the Holy of Holies at certain times. When Solomon dedicated the temple, the temple was filled with a cloud of glory. So the Shekinah, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, like Gabriel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. So that's an important term because at mass, actually in every sacrament, but it's most notable at mass, there's an epiclesis where the priest will put both of his hands um, over the bread and wine and he calls down the Holy Spirit and then the bread and wine at the words of consecration become the living Christ. So the first epiclesis that was, was at the moment of the Annunciation when the Holy Spirit overshadowed the womb of our blessed mother Mary. And Christ was conceived. So Mary is the mother of God. And um, Frank, she talked about his embarrassment the first time that um, someone tried to trip him up by saying this. You realize, don't you, that 
God has no beginning. And um, so how can Mary be the mother of God? But, but the answer is that God, Jesus is God, but he has two natures. He has the, he has a human nature. So he was born, he was um, conceived um, as a small, tiny embryo by the power of the Holy Spirit and grew in his mother's womb and was born. So the person who was born of Mary is a divine person with a human nature. So yes, she is the mother of God, but, but she's a creature. So, so think about that because God created his own mother. And so he created her to be the, the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the most wise, the most kind, Every attribute that a woman could have, our Blessed Mother has it in fullness. And at Medjugorje, um, they asked her one time, the children asked her when they were still children, they said, how come you're so beautiful? And she said, I'm beautiful because I love. Love and you will be beautiful. But God made Mary beautiful. But he made her beautiful for us. So that when we see, we imagine her in heaven, now she's been assumed into heaven. So she's there with her heart beating. And we know from the time she's appeared on earth and the people have seen her that she's just indescribably beautiful. They say there's no picture that can really compare. But, but when we see Our Lady assumed in heaven, we see the church in glory. We see God's plan for the whole bride of Christ and that is the whole body the whole all the baptized together make up the body of Christ the mystical body of Christ and so his his desire is for us to attain that beauty in union with Jesus Christ God died on the cross the divine nature cannot die but Jesus has two natures so the person who who died on the cross is Jesus Christ which he can't die as God, but he did die as man because his human nature suffered the separation of soul and body, which is what death is. So they remained separated for Friday evening and then all day Saturday until Sunday morning when he rose from the dead and his body and soul were reunited. He offered the perfect sacrifice, which is continually made present in every mass. So we enter we're present at Calvary, we're present at the resurrection every time we go to mass because the mysteries of God are outside of time, they transcend time. So the person making the offering on the cross is God, the second person of the Trinity. And so that offering has infinite value. One drop of Jesus would have been enough to redeem the whole universe, but but he chose to, to give us all his whole body and blood, like to shed all his blood for us. So, so that we would always know just how much he loves us. So Jesus had two intellects and two wills. As God, Jesus has always been omniscient. That means all-knowing. As man, he allowed himself to experience the limitations of a finite intellect, which is very interesting as you study the Gospels. He advanced in experiential knowledge in his perfect human nature. So he advanced in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. So he made it so that he had to learn like other humans have to learn like he had to learn how to be a carpenter he had to um learn learn how to speak he had to learn how to walk because he didn't um i mean his human nature was a perfect human nature but but he still had to learn like every baby doesn't come into the world knowing how to do all, you know, so he allowed himself to go through that same type of learning that we all go through. In the agony in the garden, Jesus prayed, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. So he had to conform his human, his created human will, because he had a created human soul. Um, he had to conform that will to the divine will. And it was so difficult to do that he sweat blood. I mean, to to there's never been anything more courageous, no no more courageous action on the earth than Jesus laying down his life for us. Never, because of like we will never understand 
the depth of the suffering that he entered into, not just physical suffering. I mean, the physical suffering is atrocious enough, but his moral agony that he went through, allowing himself to feel abandoned by the father, we can't even imagine what that must have been like for him. But he didn't allow his divine nature to provide him with any consolation or any any help really during the passion because he wanted to redeem humanity from within humanity. So his human soul was filled to capacity with love for the father. And that's why he laid down his life for lo and love and obedience to the father and love and obedience so that we could be redeemed. So in there's 141 gospel passages where Jesus calls our father by name. And I, I have put those into a small book for meditation because it's a beautiful meditation to just read the number of times that he calls the father by name. On the night before you offered his life on the cross, he said, greater love than this has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So Jesus has real emotions because he had a real soul and real body. Our Lord had real emotions too. And he still does. We, we grieve Jesus when we ignore him in the Eucharist or when we fail to come as often as possible to receive him in Holy Communion and unite ourselves to him. Or as he complained to St. Faustina, like when we, when we do receive him in Holy Communion, so often we're all distracted. We're thinking about other things. We don't even welcome him into our soul. What I try to do is I try to, I ask St. Joachim and St. Anne, his grandparents, and our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph and my guardian angel to welcome him, make him feel most welcome in my soul. And I try to really listen, like to close my eyes and listen when he comes to me in Holy Communion and to spend a, at least a little bit of time after Holy Communion thanking him for the great gift. What does a person who is God do with a human soul? And um, so Frank, she pointed out how interesting it is to read the Gospels from that perspective and to, to think, well, this is God who's doing this. Clearly, he does with it all that can be done with it, using every power it has to the uttermost of its possibility. We have seen that man's destiny is to do something which by nature he cannot do. See the face of God. Unaided human nature cannot do it. That superb, that incomparable soul of Christ was given sanctifying grace. It was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So that indwelling of the Holy Spirit became a new thing. And that is the indwelling which he's given to us. So what Jesus did for the human soul was he allowed it to be a capacity for sanctifying grace and the Holy Spirit, which are inestimable, infinite gifts. We know the Holy Spirit is infinite God. So let's close this by praying this um, Anima Christi prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from you. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to you, that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, and God bless you all.